And a uh, huge thanks to both Meloprops and the North Carolina Arboretum from joining with UNC Press to host press author Marcy Cohen Ferris and associate editor Casey Highsmith and contributors Courtney Lewis and Ronnie Lundy. We truly have an all-star lineup tonight. So I'm really excited about this event. As Patricia told you, my name is Erica and I'm a professor at UNC Asheville. And UNC Press is an affiliate of the UNC system and as such is the University Press for UNC Asheville. In this 2022 year, UNC Press is celebrating a century of publishing award-winning books for the Academy and for the people of North Carolina and the region. UNC Press publishes roughly 120 books a year or a new book every three to four days. Whether a scholarly monograph for the Academy or regional trade title intended for general audiences, each UNC Press title undergoes a rigorous peer review process a hallmark of university press publishing. This devotion to excellence is reflected in the numerous awards given to UNC Press titles, such as the National Book Award, the Pulitzer Prize in History, and the Bancroft Prize. As a part of this state's great public university system, the press serves the people of the state by publishing general interest books on North Carolina. Tonight's featured book is one such title. And now I'd like to introduce to you Marcy Cohen Ferris. Marcy is editor of Edible North Carolina. She is a writer and educator whose work explores the American South through its foodways, the Southern Jewish experience and material culture. She is an emeritus professor in the Department of American Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where she serves as an editor for Southern Cultures, a quarterly journal of the history and cultures of the US South. Ferris's books include the Edible South, The Power of Food and the Making of an American Region, and Matzo Ball Gumbo, Culinary Tales of the Jewish South. She is a co-editor of Jewish Roots and Southern Soil, A New History. And in 2018, she received the Craig Claiborne Lifetime Achievement Award from the Southern Foodways Alliance. Please join me in welcoming Marcy Cohen Ferris. Oh, it's, it's so great to be with y'all. And Erica, thank you for the introduction. and. I want to also note, along with um, Patricia's wonderful introduction of Erica, that Professor Locklear was named UNC Asheville's Distinguished Teacher of the Year in 2021, which is so powerful for her outstanding work in the fields of American literature, Appalachian studies, and Southern food cultures, and she's just amazing. And we're so excited about our new book that's coming out from the University of Georgia Press but later, later this year or the, or the, the beginnings of, of 2023. So Erica, thrilled, thrilled. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, we've, we've worked really closely together. And then I want to thank also Stephanie in the background for Malaprops and thank you to Malaprops and also thank you so much to to Patricia and also the North Carolina Arboretum. And all of us agreed, we wish we were there with you. And, um, and hopefully, you know, in, in months to come, we, we will be able to. But what I'm gonna do tonight, I wanna give you just, we'll, we'll get quickly to our writers, but I wanna give you a brief background on kind of an introduction to Edible North Carolina, like what the focus of this is. And then I'll introduce our essayists and I'll have a brief conversation with both Ronnie and Courtney. Courtney will do first and then Ronnie. And then we're gonna, KC is gonna introduce us to talk to about the recipes in this book because she's very skilled at recipe development among her, among her many talents. And then we'll open it up for, for some questions. So I'm gonna, we're gonna share our presentation and then uh, we'll get going here. Is everyone is everyone able to see that okay? Right, and we'll just put it in. Yep. Great. Okay. Just let me know when you're All right. Terrific. And I can, I can do it right here. All right. So um, in January of 2019, you know, way back then, um, I began a listening tour across North Carolina as editor of Edible North Carolina. And that was a journey that really started in my food studies teaching at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And in my American food studies class, we considered how race and region and gender and class and 
religion and consumer cultures and media and a million other things impact the ways we eat in this country. And as we focused more and more on the South in that class as a very powerful and very loud foodways region, I wanted students to explore what we eat and why through a lens focused solely on one state. And conveniently, that was, that was North Carolina. So I piloted that class in the spring of 2015 with the logistical planning of a brilliant former folklore graduate student, Laura Fieselman, and our teaching assistants, Katie Kloon and Victoria Bulabasis, who both have gone on from graduate school and have essays in, in this volume. I'm thrilled to have their voices. Katie is now the uh, state folklorist for Virginia. And uh, Victoria is an amazing documentary, uh, documentarian, a filmmaker, a journalist, a photographer. And among our guest lecturers for that class, back when things were happening all in purpose and in person, were uh, Ronnie Lundy, food writer Ronnie Lundy, came over to see us. And also North Carolina's Secretary of Agriculture, Steve Troxler as well. So students conducted interviews with food folks and professionals across the state, like the Colvard family uh, in Ash County, who have made molasses for over 30 years and probably way longer. And these interviews are now uh, store, are archived in UNC's Southern Oral History Collection at the Southern Historical Collection. So out of all that, came the vision for Edible North Carolina for this book. And that was to create a portrait of North Carolina's vibrant contemporary food landscapes. So I chose 20 leading journalists, chefs, entrepreneurs, scholars, activists, and food focus specialists for our writing team, along with a very talented photographer, Baxter Miller, whose family roots are in Hatteras, the other part of the state, and her stellar partner, Ryan Stancil, who grew up in Eastern North Carolina. We were trying to cover a lot of region in this state. And then chef, writer, entrepreneur, Eastern North Carolinian, Vivian Howard agreed to write our foreword, which really looks at Vivian's first kind of remembered tastes of the state. Um, it's just a kind of a really funny, interesting, poignant piece and how she's witnessed it's evolving food cultures. And then KC Highsmith, oh, and there's some of those food <laughs> cultures. KC is from Texas, but is now in North Carolina. She's a food historian, a photographer, a doctoral student in the American Studies program at UNC. And she became, and I'm so thankful, the really unshakable uh, whip smart associate editor of Edible North Carolina. And as I said, you'll hear from Casey in just a, a few minutes. So then what's, what's next? Then I got on the road, right? <laughs> because, and this was all pre, pre pandemic. I got on the road, thankfully, um, because how can you really learn about a state's food culture, you know, from your, from right here, like where I'm sitting, you know, right now in my, my, my desk chair. So, uh, I got on that road and I'm gonna share one life saving tip from my driving tour, which you might get a hint of from the S curve here on the Lynn Cove viaduct. And that is, that is, we really y'all should write this down. Always, always cut your bagel sandwich in half before you hit the road. <laughs> just, it's just generally safer, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, when you're driving, you will wanna have, when Buttons Bagel still exists in Nashville, you, you do, you know, and you're meant, you want to make sure you're safe. So that, that's a good thing. And, you know, best to prepare, prepare, <laughs> prepare. Okay. And so then I interviewed over a hundred people uh, during that time. And I, I wish I could put them all, all up here um, during my travels across North Carolina. And you'll find their voices featured in boxed quotes on the sides of the essays in, in each essay. And so they're kind of speaking, those people are kind of speaking back to our writers like Ronnie, they're engaged in conversation with Ronnie and Courtney. And uh, one of my favorite, there were some great, great interviews. We were across the state and 
these interviews, they will eventually end up in the st Southern Oral History Program as well. But one of my favorite quotes is from Morty Gaskell of Ocracoke. And he said, you know, you can't have a quaint fishing village if you don't have fishermen, which was pretty, pretty basic, right? And Morty has had his commercial fishing license there on the island of Ocracoke since he was nine years old. Um, he and other North Carolina fishermen and women are facing an influx of cheap, unregulated, imported fish. They're also dealing with rising operating costs, labor shortages, increased fishing regulations, development pressures, and more. And then just quickly, I got to tell you a story about getting over to visit Ronnie on my way to conduct interviews in Western North Carolina. I drove first to Ronnie's home in Burnsville. It was on a very soggy, cold, cold, wet, wet February day. The fog was so thick on the Blue Ridge Parkway when I popped on it that I drove north instead of south for a bit. That was wrong. Switch, switch directions. So tip two would be, I think, avoid the parkway during heavy winter fog. Like it says on the sign, don't get on the parkway, but y'all probably do that anyway. But then I got together with Ronnie and we drove on to Cherokee where hot coffee and a bagel uh, was, were waiting for us at the Kuala Java Cafe, really great coffee spot there. And there we met and spoke with Joey Al, who's Secretary of Agriculture for the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Nation. And later that evening, Ronnie and I enjoyed a restorative bowl of pho at Thai Paradise in Franklin. And Secretary Al had recommended it to us. And he told us how healing that noodle soup is after the mountain cold kind of settles into your bones. And especially if you include your own foraged and preserved mushrooms as he does. And uh, Courtney can speak. We were just talking about mushrooms with Courtney. So she can speak to that a little bit more too and related to food sovereignty. But you know, my husband, Bill Ferris, who's a folklorist, he speaks about the blues family. He was honored to document in Mississippi in the 1960s and 70s. And I love that phrase. And like Bill, I thought, oh, my God, this is what I also learned about in this state, that there was a food family across this state. And that looks like you know, brewers and distillers and chefs and dairymen and women and farmers and pit masters and fisher folk and extension agents and largely women who are in charge of aggregating local meat and orga organic produce across our state, sustainable agriculture administrators across the state, food system managers. And they all told us about their food worlds and how those worlds have both expanded but also diminished in, in different ways. So I quickly wanna tell you, you know, about the central issues in this book and then we'll move on to, to conversation. But, you know, I think this food family comes to the page in very powerful stories that address, and I'm just gonna tell you what kind of those major issues are, the local seafood movement the meaning, the identity, the sovereignty of indigenous food cultures. Black farming and the strong family bonds of Eastern North Carolina, as well as black land loss and dispossession. The value and the costs and how they're managed, how one balances those costs of pasture raised pork in North Carolina barbecue. And then the challenges of dislocated and absent food system economies in low income rural North Carolina. Food and climate change is important for us all across the state and the region. The working class foundations of North Carolina foodways in their cities like Charlotte. The influence of new Southern Latino cuisine and cooks across our state, and also the impact of contemporary immigrant culinary skill, labor, entrepreneurship in North Carolina food cultures. 
We're also seeing a new next generation of North Carolina's food family, which is really exciting. And of course, as you can see from our group gathered here tonight, Women's food leadership in North Carolina is strong and compelling, and I think very, makes, makes this food movement particularly interesting and vibrant and expressive, more so than I, I would argue than some other, other states. So I just want to wrap up by defining kind of North Carolina's contemporary food movement, and then I'll, I'll talk to Courtney but I see it as really an intersection of culinary excellence, of creative entrepreneurship, of changing populations, of historic yet evolving food, food ways and food heritage in this state, the struggle for racial justice, equity and food sovereignty, and then also a commitment to protect and sustain food resources is very strong across the state. And that is to protect for generations to come. You know, we're all really aware of that as we think about climate change and other political forces in our nation at this very moment. So let me introduce Courtney Lewis and we're gonna have, have a conversation. Courtney is a professor at the University of South Carolina at uh, Columbia in the Department of Anthropology. She did her doctoral work at Carolina. She specializes in indigenous economic studies and food and agricultural sovereignty. She's the author of Sovereign Entrepreneurs, Cherokee Small Business Owners and the Making of Economic Sovereignty, which was published by UNC Press. She's a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and she will join the Department of Anthropology at Duke University this fall, which we're really, really, really thrilled about. Welcome, Courtney. Thank you so much, Marcy. Hi, I'm so Hi. glad to have you. Thank you for being with us. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure. How are you? I, I'm in the middle of a move, so <laughs> it's you a little are. chaotic, right. but uh, doing pretty well, doing pretty well, yeah. And you were telling us what's the what's the mountain scene behind you, even though it's reversed. So this is uh, if you are driving from Cherokee to Asheville, right? Uh, and this is kind of by Silva, and there's this specific period of time in the fall where you get this mountain in the foreground with the beautiful leaves changing, uh, but you still have snow on some of the higher peaks in the background, and that's that's one of my favorite times. Oh, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. Near Silva, I hope you get to go to Thai Paradise one day where you've been. I, I have been to Thai Paradise and I agree. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. So Courtney, I wanted to begin with a story that you open your essay with, which is really powerful. And you wrote a piece about it for Southern cultures a few years ago that was really, really fascinating. But it, you end up in Bryson City in a courtroom for a trial, and ramps, our beloved ramps, are a part of it. And I, I wondered if you could kind of tell us that story a little bit and how it's connected to your essay, which is entitled "Food Sovereign," you know, "Food Sovereignty." Mm -hmm. So this, uh, the court date was November twenty third, two thousand and nine. Um, and it's really what sparked my passion for indigenous food justice. Uh, the day before that, I happened to be having lunch uh, with some other Cherokee folk, um, and a friend got a phone call about a trial that was going to start the next morning uh, involving an Eastern band of Cherokee Indian citizen uh, who had been gathering ramps. Um, so we all knew at, at that time, because news does travel fast on the Kuala boundary, uh, that people were going to be coming out to support him, um, also to keep an eye on the case. So I just cleared my schedule and prepared to hunker down in the courtroom the next day and just wait for the case to come up. So that next day, I sat in a courtroom in Bryson City, North Carolina, and I watched uh, Mr. George Burgess, is his name, 
basically defend a practice that is thousands and thousands of years old, which is the gathering of ramps. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, this is a the one of the earliest spring greens in the mountains. So it's it's very important uh, to diets there. Uh, gathering ramps in the historic Cherokee land that is now known as the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. And he did lose that case that day, but the more important bit is that it really lit a fire that has now led to the beginning of this reclamation of Cherokee harvesting rights that we're seeing today. Wow. It's so power. How long did the trial go on, actually? It was a few hours. It was long. There were a lot of expert witnesses, people from the National Park Service. We had elders coming in. Dr. Amanda Swimmer was there. Um, lots of folks giving testimony on both sides. Uh, so it's it took a while for something that was, was basically a citation. Uh, but again, the, the information that came out of that was invaluable. Wow. So you just talked about it, it re food reclamation. Yes. And I, I thought, could you explain for us what the term food sovereignty means? And also maybe connected to that, the idea of food justice, because these are so, so critical for us to understand today. Yeah, they are absolutely critical. Uh, when I use the word food sovereignty, I rely on um, the 2007 definition, which came from a conference that was held. It's a grassroots farmers movement, uh, and this would have been the first global forum on food sovereignty. And what they decided in their declaration is that food sovereignty is the right of peoples to a healthy and culturally appropriate food uh, that is being produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and their right to not only define but to practice their own food and agricultural systems so there's really three parts here healthy culturally appropriate um, the ecologically sound and sustainable and then being able to implement your own agricultural systems for this so when I think about the differences between food sovereignty and food justice, food sovereignty for me is internal. It's what we do as indigenous people, it's what we do as Cherokee people to secure our own authority for our ability to feed ourselves. When I think about food justice, to me, food justice is what we do externally to fight for that right to feed ourselves healthy and culturally appropriate food. Yeah, that's that's a really important way to look at it. I think those you make a great connection there. Um, and that definition to me, it it it's it's a really powerful definition from that first global forum, right? In Mali. Yes. Incredible. And now in today, indigenous peoples and many peoples <laughs> Uh, across the state of, of, of North Carolina are thinking about food sovereignty and what that means for their communities. But I think it begins with indigenous food cultures and indigenous people in our state. And you also begin your essay by talking about, can you tell us how you begin it? Because you talk about kind of what's been left out of kind of our, our kind of stereotyped ways that the southern food is presented so a lot of what you will read about if you read early european writings from the initial contact period is a lot of descriptions of this kind of pristine untouched eden uh, that is the eastern coast that uh, they are moving into right right um, and they're correct it was it was an incredibly rich landscape, a lush landscape uh, with an abundance of food. But what they failed to acknowledge was that these rich landscapes were not pristine. They were not untouched. They were the direct result of thousands and thousands of years 
of highly complex, um, not only agriculture, but agroforestry techniques that were being used by American Indian peoples. Um, so we might think of things like prescribed burns, these type of things. Uh, but again, they were highly cultivated, um, not just in what we think of as farming and agriculture, but the forest themselves were highly cultivated. That That is so powerful to me, that idea of, you know, that those kind of really sophisticated agroforestry techniques and methodologies. And I think you know, when I when I was reading that in your essay, I was so connected back to when I was a graduate student a thousand million years ago, William and Mary. But I, what, how groundbreaking, you know, uh, what kind of life changing for me was just to even read like William Cronin's work, Changes in the Land, mm -hmm. and to understand that you know he was an ecological, you know, uh, historian, and to understand that you know these the process of settler colonialism and maybe you can explain what that term means too but these very these these the europeans coming in and with this mindset that they can't imagine that there's any other mindset but their own but tell mm -hmm. what's that term mean because you use that as well in your essay the settler colonialism yeah so when we talk about settler colonialism it's to define out a couple of different um, nuances, right? So when we think about colonialism, colonialism is an extractive process, right? It's about going in and extracting labor, about extracting resources. Now, when we talk about settler colonialism, that moves from an extraction model to a settling model. So these are people that are not going in and extracting and bringing out, but going in to claim right? They're going in to settle and claim land. Uh, and part of settler colonialism is that unlike colonialism, it's not an event. They're not going to go in, harvest rubber and leave, right? It is a structure that is now in place, right? Settler colonialists are there to stay. So it's ongoing. Uh, and part of settler colonialism is erasure. So when we think about uh, how Europeans do not mention the high cultivation that was required to keep up what's now known as the Great Smoky Mountains National Park area. Part of that erasure is part of settler colonialism. So not only do settler colonialists need to literally erase indigenous people from the land, but also erase the knowledge around that as well. Um, okay. Because they're looking to claim the land, right? You can't claim land that's already claimed. So right. you need to erase it first, then you can claim it. Right, and that's really what you bring up too so powerfully in Sovereign Entrepreneurs as well, your book. And, you know, and I was thinking as you were talking too that it also, it just kind of brings us up to this contemporary flattened understanding that many people have of Southern food, of, of popular Southern food cultures and all the erasure of indigenous voices in Southern food ways and, you know, you say it, Melinda Maynard Lowry says it, indigenous food ways are Southern food ways. You know, that's that's our foundation. And it's like, we need to reteach, you know, yeah. that this is foundational. And I think you do such a beautiful job of kind of helping us understand those foundational foods mm -hmm. uh, within, within North Carolina. So I wanted to ask you too, when you were talking about these interventions you talk briefly about the kind of natural and human generated disasters that harmed Cherokee people and the lands they cultivated, particularly for connected to their, their, their food ways and food, you know, and survival. Can you just speak quickly to, that's a hard question for quick, but <laughs> maybe the, 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 the human generated disaster that we most are familiar with. Mm -hmm. uh, so for the, the human part of that, of course, the biggest impact would have been the period of 1830 to 1838, which was the federal government's period of these genocidal forced marches of Southeastern Native nations. And this includes the Cherokee Nation's Trail Where They Cried. So more commonly known as the Trail of Tears in the Cherokee language, it literally translates to the Trail Where They Cried. 
And this claimed at least 4,000 lives, Cherokee lives. And this relates back uh, to the food because these Cherokee lands uh, were prime developed agricultural lands. They were prime areas of business commerce. Uh, and when the Cherokees were uh, forcibly marched off these lands, they were then claimed by uh, settler colonialists for not only things like gold mining, which is what we're normally told, but also even almost more importantly was plantation expansion. So they really wanted these lands, um, not just for this gold, but also to expand uh, southern plantations. And that, of course, left the Cherokees that were then in Oklahoma to completely redevelop in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, which is the Cherokee Nation. It's still the Cherokee Nation capital. Um, all that they had built from scratch in Georgia. So there are really multiple levels to this land being claimed. You made me think about another example. I've been talking a lot to Diane Flint of Froggy Ridge Cider, uh, Cidery up in, in Virginia, and she's working on a book that will be forth on, on the history of Southern apples that will be forthcoming from UNC Press. And she learned so much about the fruit orchards that were stolen from indigenous people mm -hmm. in, in Western North Carolina, in Georgia. Yeah. Yep. So powerful. So um, I don't know if we can switch back to the slides to, can we do that um, easily? Yeah. Or I just wanted to show some photographs from Courtney's. There we go. There we go. So Courtney, I wanted you to speak to this a little bit because I love the section of your essay about the Cherokee Indian Fair that was actually begun in 1922 in Cherokee mm -hmm. and takes place each fall. Can you talk about the Indian dinners that are served at the fair and um, also dessert? I, I thought that was so powerful. If you go to the booth for the North American Indian Women's Association Kitchen. But what are, what are we looking at here? I love talking about Indian dinners, so this is great. Um, and just to let folks know, you can find Indian dinners year round. There are restaurants in Cherokee that serve them on very specific nights, uh, so you have to figure out what those are. But I especially like being at the fair for the Indian dinners because you get to see so many different family variations. Um, so they're all gonna vary a little bit depending on which family is cooking them. Uh, what ingredients are available. But here you can see kind of a on the left, a typical Indian dinner. It usually includes uh, bean bread, which is kind of on the right hand side of that platter. Uh, and that's, bean bread. That's the recipe that's in the in, in your rest at the end of your recipe. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's more of a dumpling than bread. So don't go in thinking that you're going to get a biscuit, right? This is, it's more of a large dumpling. Um, and these dinners are often served with uh, fatback, fried chicken, uh, as we see here, or the local trout, if you're in uh, the Kuala Boundary in particular, and then potatoes, cabbage, beans, hominy. If you're really lucky, like we see at the top of this picture, uh, you might have a family that's serving ramps, which have been frozen from the spring harvest, um, mixed in with scrambled eggs. Um, and they are, they're, just delicious. I love them. And then, of course, at the fair, you have many dessert options. I like going for strawberry shortcake uh, at the kitchen of the, the, as you mentioned, North American Indian Women's Association. Um, now, even more than that, they host other food events. Uh, and one of my favorites there is blackberry dumplings. Uh, they do a phenomenal blackberry. And I'm, I love blackberries. They're one of my favorites. Um, so that's some of my favorites. Now, we use bean bread now. Uh, however, we would have in the past made chestnut bread more. Um, and I still, chestnut bread is still my favorite savory dish. Like I will eat chestnut. I mean, I love bean bread, but I will eat chestnut bread first for sure. Um, and I love having wishy mushrooms with that as well. Beautiful. Yeah, just delicious so 
I, I encourage everybody to go up and support these vendors and these businesses. Thank you, Courtney. That's beautiful. I'm going to move us into conversation with Ronnie, Ronnie now, and, and then we'll, we'll have you here with us too if, for more questions. So thank you. Thank you. Ronnie Lundy. Yes. Um, Ronnie, let me, let me introduce Ronnie quickly. The woman that needs no introduction, but <laughs> Ronnie was born in Corbin, Kentucky. Um, these are her bona fides. She is a writer and a journalist. Um, she has long chronicled the people of Appalachia through their music and food. She was a restaurant reviewer for many, many years and important reviewer and important work that she did, a music critic for the Courier Journal in Louisville and the former editor of Louisville Magazine. Um, she is widely published uh, in the world of Southern food studies and food ways. 2017, Ronnie received a James Beard Award for her groundbreaking book for our region, uh, Vittles and Appalachian Journey with Recipes. And it's sitting right, right here. And then just recently, because she just didn't have enough on her, on her plate already, she opened, uh, became a new bookseller in, in Burnsville. And I've seen pictures of Plot Hound books and I'm thrilled to see this happening. So welcome, Ronnie. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. And, and, and before we let Courtney go, when is the Cherokee Fair, please? It is in the fall, uh, and as long as we have safe COVID times, it should be back on again. Wonderful. Thank you. I, I know. I don't want to miss it. That's right. I'm hungry right now. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Ronnie, let me, yeah. let, me, let me talk to you about your essay, yeah. which... I, I love, I mean, I love, I love all the essays there wow. because we have great storytellers. We really have people like Ronnie who know how to tell a powerful story. And I really hear Ronnie's journalist voice in this piece as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I went to Ronnie and said, I, I want you because of the work that she's done her whole life, but also particularly because of the power of Vittles of that, of her recent book. I wanted her to tell me what did she want to share with us about the, the about the a Western North Carolina, about the Appalachian and mountain sides of mountain sides part of the state, and its perspective on North Carolina's contemporary food movement. And you came back, you circled around, but you came back to Asheville, and I I wanted to know why. That's a good question. Um, and in part, it was because there was a story there that I had always wanted to tell that I, that not so much that I wanted to tell the story, I wanted to have a record of a specific period of time in Asheville that was not necessarily, um, I mean, Asheville, had certain unique properties to it, but it it managed to provide a larger story about what is happening with contemporary Appalachian food and food ways. Um, we're having a we're having a moment. We were having a moment before COVID, and then we had COVID, and now we're having a moment again. There was um, an extraordinary piece that Kat Kinsman did for Food and Wine recently about Travis Milton that focused on Travis Milton, uh, a chef in Southwestern Virginia, but that actually opens up this much larger story about why this food matters right now, other than just the fact that it tastes so good, why it matters in terms of telling our stories and an, an American story. And uh, I've written so many different pieces of this. You know, I've written, um, uh, we, you and I went to interview Ashley Shanti at Bene, and I was able to write about that. And I've written about Bill Bess, the seed saver from Western North Carolina, who's now in Kentucky. We kind of reverse migrated. Um, and, you know, his seed saving, there's so many stories I've written, but I never had the chance to tell this specific story about 
a specific time in Asheville. And one of the things that you said to me, Marcy, uh, in your concept for this book was that you wanted to capture um, a snap, it's not really a snapshot, it's like one of those panoramic shot, uh, photographs of this time in West, in North Carolina's food history. And I felt like the story, this story that I wanted to tell about Asheville was, a still picture that that could broaden out. So that's why I chose that. Yeah. Story. Mm -hmm. I love Ronnie that you said you wanted a record and because that that means so much to me. I I see this book as really powerful in that way because it does start to codify in a way, even if we're capturing a moment in time. But I, I wanted students to understand and, and now the kind of general reading public I wanted that on the page. You know, what did what were the forces that came together across our state? And you really identify how the, that intersection of the particular type of farming in in Western North Carolina and creativity and and so many other factors that are unique to to that place. And we'll, we can come back to this, but I these are the the people that you kind of came down to, to really profile, to tell that story. And I wondered if you could just say a, maybe a little bit about, about each. Yeah, and, and I let me see if I can try to uh, bring together this confluence by talking about each of them, this confluence that was in Asheville of all these tributaries. I, I kind of think of it as, you know how in our history there'll be tributaries of rivers and where they all come together suddenly springs up a metropolis, um, uh, a center of commerce and culture and uh, creativity. Um, and so there were these rivers that were converging in Asheville. One of the things that you mentioned is the type of farming that is specific to the Southern Appalachians. We, because of our topography, which you can see right here behind Jamie Ager, he's in the, the red jacket in the first picture, and he's standing on the land that is Hickory Nutcap Farm in Fairview, North Carolina. And he is, as you can see, hemmed in by mountains. Um, and, and what you don't see is that he looks like he's standing on a pretty flat place. But if you start to look around, you're going to see it going up and down, and you're going to see it narrowing in and widening out. And so we never in the Southern Appalachians, because of our topography, we were never able to develop the kind of factory farming that occurs, say, even in, in the more eastern part of our state are in the Midwest, are um, in the in the West and Northwest. We had to continue to do small farming, and we had to continue to be extremely conscious of the radical differences that you get in a farm that's broken up in all these little pieces. So that to talk about Bill Best, if you plant a bean seed in this hollow and you plant a seed from the same pod in the hollow the next step over, you're gonna get two different beans because you have two different, you have two different climates, you have two different relationships of sun. So, so we had, while, while the rest of the world um, following the countercultures back to the land movement and the Alice Waters, uh, story and yada yada while the rest of the world was going how do we get back to small farming we were able to say how do we keep doing what we're doing here how do we learn from the not from a book that was written 50 years ago but how do we learn from the farmer who has the farm next to mine so that was happening. Jamie Ager, who is in the first picture, was a student. At, he and his wife, Amy, were students at Warren Wilson College. I moved to Asheville the first time in 2001. I met them uh, through my daughter and son-in-law. 
uh, who were also at Warren Wilson. Warren Wilson um, was one of the first farm colleges, um, it's certainly in the South, and I think actually in, in the United States, they had a working farm along with Berea College. Berea phased out their working farm and then rephased it in recently. Warren Wilson's never went anywhere. So they, so in Asheville in the early 2000s, Warren Wilson was sending out into the community these young people with dreams and ambition and energy and also the extraordinary skills to do um, thoughtful husbandry and thoughtful growing. And these kids were coming into a world that already had established elders that they could work with and learn from. And all of this is happening at the time that they're suddenly becoming an interest in eating the foods of the region. The farm to table movement is happening. And um, two people whose pictures aren't in here, but who are mentioned in my essay, who are very important to this were John and Julie Stelling, who opened the Early Girl restaurant in 2002 in downtown Asheville. Um, they had worked at Tupelo Honey, which was focused on Southern food and Southern food ways, authentic Southern food. And um, John took that to um, more hyper local level by going out and seeking um, farmers in the region he would just drive around and when he saw something growing that looked interesting, he'd get out of his car and say, what is this? And talk to the farmer and find out how they cooked it and put it on his menu. Um, so that is one piece of what was happening in Asheville. For the next piece, let's jump all the way to the photograph at the end of that series. And that is a guy named Mark Rosenfeld, who I met in the late 1990s when I came to Asheville to, to promote a book I had written about Southern fruits and vegetables called Butter Beans to Blackberries. And Mark was, um, was the guy who came to the television studio with all my food prepared uh, so I could look good on TV, you know? Um, and um, Mark and I got into a conversation and I discovered that in the 1970s, he had uh, come to the mountains. Uh, what does he say? He blames it on James Taylor, right? Yeah. <laughs> he, you know, he'd come grab, to grab your gal and, and grab your gal and head to the mountains. And he had landed in the Highland at that time, Highland, North Carolina. And he opened a restaurant there doing farm to table before anybody was talking about it. Um, um, certainly before it became this, this very famous thing, he was sourcing from his farmers there. And by the 1980s, I think it is, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be exactly accurate about dates. Um, uh, uh, I'll be Heather Cox Richardson and say somewhere in this time, look it up, <laughs> you know, double check me. But Mark, Decide, Mark came to Asheville and opened up the Marketplace restaurant. And one of the things I love about it was that he had, basically he had a huge aquarium in his kitchen so that he could have live trout brought to him from the mountains and cook it and serve it. And it's almost out of the river state, right? So Mark was kind of, um, do we call him the godfather yes. in the book? Yes, of this whole movement. He, he really, he created an appetite among the people of Asheville for this type of food. And he put it on the plate in a very, very elegant way. Um, and he started supporting people like Looking Glass Creamery um, and um, the trout farmers. I can't think of their name right now, I apologize. Um, but these were people that he was not only serving in his restaurant, but he was sending this food to Europe and he was sending this food to New York. He was sending these products and saying, you know, pay attention to this. We have something extraordinary here. And, um, you know, and Ronnie, as you were talking and I was thinking, 
you know, it's like the very early 70s, like 1971, that he had that he and his partner, uh, and wife, partner uh, opened the Frog and Owl Cafe. Yeah, I think 1971, 1973, Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, 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 po the politics of also of, of Mark moving, you know, to the mountains. You know, right. he left. He left Florida. He left that background, and you know about an intentional life. And it was—it's so much the, the 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 power of of the counterculture of social justice of civil rights for women. Uh, and uh, it's it's amazing to think of, of where of where we are today. And I was thinking too when you mentioned Julie Stelling, Julie in an interview with her, she said, "You you can't have breakfast in Nashville without an avocado." You right. Know, it's like right. a law. Right. Julie told me I had avocado toast for breakfast. Um, you know, but Julie, uh, Julie told me once that um, uh, one of the first things that they figured out at Early Girl was that they would have two kinds of gravy. One gravy would be made with the sausage that John made in the kitchen, you know, going back to doing his old sausage routine. And the other gravy would be vegan. It would be vegan gravy. And I, when the Lee brothers, the Lee brothers came and I think it was about 2002 or three that they came and did a story about Asheville for travel and leisure. And I told them at that point that that sums up Asheville, that, that, that describes this coming together of the, again, these old traditions, the sausage that you make yourself. And if you're lucky, you cure it in a clean sock in the smokehouse mm -hmm. and you make, you can have that kind of gravy or you have vegan gravy. So these two, these two worlds that to some people, to people who carry a stereotype of either the counterculture or the stereotype of Appalachian people, these two cultures seem completely opposed to one another. But in fact, when you know the true story of the region, they come together and meet in such a harmonious way. And Mark talks about that. I wish I could remember the term in, that he uses in the book, but he talks about the fact that, that there is um, an ethos in the mountain and John Fleer talks about that, which takes us to the, the next picture. Um, uh, so you'll know John Fleer because he's the last guy in this story, right? In the pictures. And, and Fleer talked about it too, that when he came, so he is from the Eastern part of the state around, um, and but he came to Blackberry Farm in the mountains of Tennessee. Uh, in the late 1980s, and he was determined to try to understand the food of the region. Uh, he started going around, he, you know, he met Alan Benton, who cures that glorious bacon and, and those wonderful hams, and uh, he hooked up with the folks from Muddy Pond, who continue to make sorghum syrup, which is, um, um, very prized and beloved in the mountains. It has, all of these things have what I call mountain umami, which is a rich resonance and a flavor. And John got that immediately. He figured that out and he started putting it on the plate at Blackberry Farm. But what he did there was to put on the plate also the story of these people and this, he wanted he wanted what he was doing to tell the story of the place where people were eating. And he did that for many years at Blackberry. He went to the Highlands for a little while, but we feel like he was always on his way to Asheville because it is, uh, it is absolutely the perfect spot for his vision. Um, which Ronnie, you, before, and, and we'll talk, Casey's gonna talk about the recipe you chose for yes. for your essay and before we move on to KC to talk because our time is short you describe Elizabeth Sims as the rainmaker and, yes. and in a sentence or two what 
she has been so strong in communications and public relations. We know Elizabeth from her work at Biltmore to, to writing To Below Honey's great cookbook and many and many more. But I don't know about we do. I will say this. There's so many places that we don't know Elizabeth's hand is in the mix, but right. she, I met her um, before I came to Asheville and we became friends and started working together. She was an early president of the Southern Foodways Alliance. And she, through her work at Southern Foodways, initially took on um, the role of creating events to spread the story of what was actually going on in Appalachia. And I do talk about that in the book. Um, two things, um, she did a, an SFA event um, that in the early 2000s that brought people in that group to the region and to learn about the food and food ways. And, and then in 2008, she created an 11 day extravaganza at the Biltmore that brought everyone, including what I would call a toddler, Sean Brock, uh, who was so excited to be there and so excited to be around his heroes. And, and he made, um, he made corn, cornbread for me. John uh, Edgerton and I had a corn cake uh, throw down and Sean made my corn cakes. Um, for me at that. Elizabeth brought all these people together to keep conversations going. And she has been such a behind the scenes force and powerhouse in the food and food ways and in what has happened in Asheville in the 20 years that I have been personally in and out of the region and observing it. So these four people, they're, they're by no means the only four people uh, they, and there's a cast of hundreds uh, or dozens at least in Asheville. We could put four different pictures up and I could rattle on about them. But these, these four people I think were integral to what Asheville continues to evolve and become. Yeah, and they've, lastly, I'll just, and then we'll, we'll go to KC. They've all been involved, all these folks in the We Give a Share program that came of COVID to, yeah. to meet the community's needs. And, and that's all, that's so powerful. So Ronnie, thank you. Yes, we're all, incredible. We're gonna, we're gonna move on to, to KC. And KC, take it away. Yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to share a little bit about the recipes, which I think are so integral in this book um, and, and a very unique kind of approach to sharing uh, this, these stories. So with each diverse and powerful essay in the book, there's an equally powerful and unique recipe that accompanies it. And there's so much context, cultural, social, generational, that we can glean from recipes, both historic and contemporary. So it was crucial to include these sources about the North Carolina food landscape in the book. Um, and each author contributed a family or personal recipe or worked with us to create a recipe that uh, complemented their essay. And I tested each of the recipes. Before I came to grad school, I was a recipe developer and um, stylist. So it was a very exciting thing to get back into. Um, you test them all at least once. So that means many times, most of them. Um, and you made sure the ratios were accurate and were easily reprodu reproducible in a home kitchen so that any cook could create them. Um, an important element to testing was finding the right ingredients, specifically because we had so many diverse foodways represented in the book. So this involved uh, working with contributors like Andrea Rusing to connect with her butcher to find a very specific cut of meat, um, asking a fellow food photographer for um, uh, some amchur, which is a dried mango powder that's very important um, in Chidi Kumar's recipe, and visiting new to me food shops just kind of across the state for various ingredients, um, including some of them that you see here. Um, and these are all kind of behind the scene pictures of me just doing the recipe testing. These didn't make it into the book. Um, in recipe testing, it's important to translate ingredients and instructions so that readers understand them and can produce the recipe with good results every time. And every publication has its own style, how you spell out ingredients, lemon zest versus grated lemon rind. If you're someone who consumes food media, you probably notice this between publications. 
Um, other things might be the order of instructions and, uh, you know, other kind of styling within the recipe. UNC Press, like most publications, has a style guide as well. And for Edible North Carolina, it was very important that our author's diverse voices and culinary backgrounds remain true to form. Contemporary recipes often lack the embodied knowledge that so many of us use in our own cooking. In other words, the importance of cooking by feeling and taste. So we worked with editorial staff at the press to retain SAS language, the, the, yeah, SAS language and intent in their recipes. And everyone had a different kind of approach, which was really exciting in terms of editing. Um, and in terms of testing the recipes. So for example, the specific steps for forming and cooking Courtney's bean bread recipe, um, which is pictured on that previous slide, um, which was a very new to me process, um, but I, I was very excited to learn this different way. Um, it was very similar to me, Courtney, as um, the tamales I grew up in eating in South Texas. So I had, I felt like I had a little bit of an advantage there. <laughs> Um, or the flexible measurements of ingredients in Michelle King's fried rice, and then sourcing these really particular ingredients and how they're talked about in the vinaigrette that's in Ronnie's uh, essay. Um, and during, oh, that's not it, sorry. <laughs> and during the photo shoot, we checked in with our authors to triple check the recipes. And I remember calling Shorla Amons, who was pictured a few slides ago at one point, who held the phone out to her mother um, about the shape and the thickness of the family's tea cakes, which we had very wrong at first. Um, and we changed from cut rounds, like little biscuity type things to thick square tea cakes about the size of your hand, um, which was very different. <laughs> Um, and we texted Melinda Maynard Lowry, uh, as well as a bunch of other people, um, but her in particular oh, has, has stuck with me um, this conversation. I um, have to show the shape of this is what a tea cake is supposed of, to look like. The tea cakes, we cut them into rounds. No, no, no. We got chastised. Okay. And it was, it was good. It's good that we did. And then you learning the. Oh, the collars. <laughs> Yeah, so um, Melinda, uh, Melinda Maynard Lowry's, uh, we sent her a picture of the finished collard sandwich and the process. She and I had already talked about how thinly to cut the ribbons, which was good. Um, but I sent her this picture um, to make sure it was just right. And as a relatively new to North Carolina person, one of the biggest honors of my food career and person living here in North Carolina now was Professor Maynard Lowry telling me that the collard sandwich was absolutely perfect, just like a local would prepare. So I feel like I'm allowed to live here for a few more years. <laughs> Um, so finding joy, comfort, memory, new flavors, and community is a critical, important aspect of food knowledge and recipe development. And we hope that the recipes in Edible North Carolina give readers that opportunity too, to see that um, alongside the essays. Wow. And I, Casey's work with, oh, sorry. has been incredible in, and, and also, you know, the, the story that like Michelle King is a professor and teaches Chinese history uh, and, and many other uh, areas uh, um, at UNC Chapel Hill. She's a mom too. So that dish is a great weeknight, quick meal. Yeah. And, and her instructions for it were so great, but like make enough, have it was leftover handfuls. rice, it was, it was... handfuls of this, like you do. What do you open your refrigerator? What do you have? You know, what's come in? from your CSA that's getting a little tired, you know, and you know, what do you, what's, what kind of protein do you have? And yeah, we kept that language. Yeah, we did. And it was integral. And I think, yeah. And then being able to see like the language, uh, I'm thinking about bean bread too, just something that would be very different for, I'm sure a lot of folks who've never had it before mm -hmm. and having those steps very clearly laid out while still having Courtney's like very necessary language in there. So people can get a feel for the recipe while still hopefully being able to recreate it at home. Um, yeah, it was, it was a really fun process. Thank you. And y'all, I just want to recognize since we're talking and we're celebrating the hundredth anniversary of the press, a very important person to me in the press's history. And that's Elaine Maisner, who recently retired from the press um, after 35 years of a stellar career in the field of academic publishing and she was my, has been my editor for, for all my work and hopefully will be <laughs> for Casey as well. And I know she's worked really closely with Erica too and talked with Erica about her work and certainly with, um, with, with Courtney as, as well. And um, I, I wanna just recognize Elaine's work, but let's, we don't have a lot of time and maybe we can go over our time just a little bit, but let's open it up for, and I, we, can, we can have questions from, you know, our guests, or we can have questions from each other for each other. So thank y'all, everybody. Thanks to be together. It's really powerful. I want to be really together, though.
I do too. Let's have a party. <laughs> well, it's, it's been a fantastic conversation and we're so glad that we, even though we run over a little bit, that's just like, that's like getting a second helping. Was it okay to say that? Make those, make those mm-hmm. jokes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And um, I wonder if we could start off with a question. And this question is for Dr. Lewis. And this is a kind of an in the weeds or maybe in the ramps question. Um, And it's about the anthropologist uh, Renato Rizaldo and imperialist nostalgia. Is that okay to to do a little imperialist nostalgia question for you, Dr. Lewis? And take it back, take it back to to the 80s. Let's take it back to the 80s and the 90s. (laughs) And what reminded me of uh, his work and this idea of imperial and nostalgia is food, food evokes so much in terms of memory and nostalgia. And of course, a lot of our conversation, particularly when it relates to indigenous peoples, sometimes is, uh, has a connection to what's been lost, but also what's been retained. And I wonder if you have um, in your work in anthropology and looking at food, come across uh, that idea of this kind of imperialist nostalgia. And that's that for our audience, what's been destroyed, the people who destroy something also uh, mourn it at the same time in a paradoxical way. This is a great question because I, I, I think, uh, especially American Indians are the embodiment of imperial nostalgia, right? Uh, we are constantly disappearing. We are constantly being mourned by settler colonial society, um, even though we are not disappearing and we are not gone. Um, and this kind of constant disappearing allows for a lot of cultural appropriation, um, a lot of claiming to what's what's going on, um, because if people are gone, then there's there's no one that you're stealing from, right? Um, and I think the the Ramps article that I wrote really speaks to this because one of the reasons that Ramps, in fact, the primary reason um, that Ramps were banned from harvesting initially uh, by the National Park Service was because we had. Uh, many, many people who had absolutely no experience in harvesting ramps um, that were sent out by restaurants when uh, settler non-native society suddenly discovered ramps, right? Which, uh, of course, Cherokees have been harvesting for millennia. Um, So when non-natives discovered ramps, people swarmed into the forest and destroyed. And ramps are very slow growing. You can only harvest maybe 10% of a ramp patch without um, doing permanent damage. You have to be able to cut it at the right spot or else you will kill the entire plant. Um, so it's a very delicate process of harvesting. And if it, if it wasn't for this kind of imperial nostalgia, that is, they are gone and therefore we have access to this. Um, I don't think you would have had this kind of over harvesting and even the National Park Service study that was done on ramp harvesting didn't even consult with Cherokee people at all in their consultations. So the banning of ramps is predicated on the erasure of Cherokee scientific knowledge and therefore the erasure of Cherokee people. So this isn't something where it's just in the past or something that people used to do, but it's an ongoing part of food justice today. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for, for that question. The answer to that question, I really, I really appreciate it. And uh, then another question uh, for the group. What's it, what was it like to try to craft your essay uh, and uh, how is it to be edited? Was the editing process fun? You can tell us. We won't tell anybody. Ronnie, well, it was wonderful. <laughs> um, I, uh, it, yes, well, it, it was like waking up and knowing that Marcy's going to kill me if I don't get this in. <laughs> Right. <laughs> true. Uh, true. Absolutely true. The editing I thought was marvelous. Um, 
it it was thoughtful um it um i was asked for specific things that improved um what i was doing and uh was not uh was not subjected to absurdities which is not always the case you know so yeah i have nothing but but good things to say uh, about the editing. I hope you're not going to ask the editor what it was like to get these stories out of us. Yes, I was. No. Thank you. But you asked it. So it's the pressure's off me. <laughs> I, I think Courtney Lewis might have been the first person to turn in yeah. her essay. Yeah, you get a gold star for sure. Oh, <laughs> Award winning oh, answer. Oh, we're going to talk. <laughs> oh, my <her>. gosh. <laughs> Ronnie, not, not so much, but. <laughs> But that's okay. I knew it was coming. I knew I, there was never, never a doubt. We knew where you lived. So yes, we I knew I, you knew where I lived. That was yeah. the problem. Yeah. But these were incredible people to, it's an honor, an honor to receive their work um, and to be in a collaborative process. That's very exciting together. And mm -hmm. that was why we chose the people we did for this volume. Well, I'd like to give you uh, the last word and then Marcy, and if you could please uh, bring it together for us, a palate cleanser, if you will. Oh, <laughs> okay, now that's three. You don't I get can't, a <laughs> well, Hang on, there might be, but that's okay. You know what we're talking about here, and I think you can really hear it from all the voices here and different generations, particularly gathered here of women scholars, writers, journalists that are involved is an evolving, powerful movement. And I think we would all test, you know, t you know, testify to the fact that there is something unique about North Carolina that has shaped, and I, I try to discuss this in my introduction too, but like Ronnie said, and, and also Courtney, you really have to go back to this history to understand the movement today. And it was very important to me that we kind of lay that groundwork to understand what is this movement about? You know, did it just suddenly appear out of, out of our, you know, out of this space, you know, in the, in the 1970s, the 1980s, as Ronnie shows us in her essay, you know, there were many factors, many historical factors, um, you know, uh, the uh, geographic factors, factors to do with climate. We see that in, in, in Courtney's essay as well, that shape, these movement, the what we how we eat in North Carolina, and then what has happened, and the re, the reaction to it, and changing it, and countering it, and moving this movement forward today, and certainly there's no no more uh, like when we see how the movement has how the food movement has responded to the pandemic and to the challenges of our very fraught time that we're living in, um, you know, and and, and responded with great resilience. But also, I, I think the last thing I'd say is that, you know, we've we've also turned to, to one another and to each other in the state and said, but where, where, where were we not there? Where were the absences? Where are they today? What, what are, who is, who remains hungry? Who remains erased? Um, what's, what, whose voices? I'm, I'm thankful women are here tonight speaking because again, that's, critical to, to what we all do here in this state, how we eat, how we care for one another. And um, it's just an evolving, uh, exciting, uh, deep, complex story that, that speaks to us of the American South through, through this very expressive language and of North Carolina. Let's, the last thing I'll say is that I think our work here in the state really speaks to national and even global issues within the food uh, you know, across around the world. And this is just kind of coming in on, you know, narrowing in on one place that everyone's essay, someone said to me when after they read it that, oh, it, it could be edible California, you know, in, in that the issues are very, very, very similar now, but, but we're taking it, from, but we're taking it from the perspective of this place where there is such a kind of rich gathering of, of, of voices of that food family. But thank you for having us together. It means the world to us and for Malaprops and for the Arboretum has deep significance for this work too. Yes. Well, 
Thank you so much. We want to honor our collaboration with the UNC Press, and we've certainly worked several times with and hope to work again with the North Carolina Arboretum. Congratulations on this fantastic book, Edible North Carolina, A Journey Across a State of Flavor, edited by Marcy Cohen Ferris, photographs by Baxter Miller, and the forward by Vivian Howard. You've been listening to a very gratifying conversation among a, a great group of people who are bringing all their different views and their love of food and history and cultures uh, to this uh, story tonight. And I want to thank uh, Ronnie Lundy. Uh, Stephanie is on behind the scenes and she's been, everybody take a look at that uh, chat because there's a, a lot there that you'll, uh, if you have the link, uh, you can come back and watch that video. I want to thank Professor Courtney Lewis so much. And thanks for taking on that imperialist nostalgia question, Dr. Lewis. I really, I really wanted to know, I really did. And I want to also thank uh, Dr. Locklear for her introduction as well. And then uh, Casey Highsmith, we appreciate you. Thanks for going over those recipes. Don't worry, you can go back and, and watch this video. You didn't miss anything. You'll come back and get it again and you can, uh, can get those recipes and all that good information. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening virtually. Have a lovely evening.